Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three sword and sorcery systems that are all really recently released in this past few months, um, some of them just in the past few weeks. The first is the Sword of Cepheus, I think is how you say it. Cepheus? I think it's Cepheus though. Um, the second is Million Colored Sun. And the third is Tales of Argosa. So all three are sword and sorcery games, and they're all three very different, different levels of complexity, different levels of, in my opinion, different levels of interest, but they're all really good. And I think you would be well suited to check any of them out. I certainly have my preferences among them for different things, but let's start off with the Sword of Cepheus, which is the second edition of this book. And again, I think it's Cepheus, but that's just how I think you read it. Um, it's the second edition of this book. Now, right off the bat, I will say, I, with the sword and sorcery tone and vibe, I don't particularly like the font choice <laughs> of the whole book. It doesn't doesn't lend itself to a sort of sword and sorcery vibe. The other two, well, we'll see Million Colored Sun is a little bit more generic in its font choice, but there's a lot of incidental art that really, really brings it in and helps it with the particular vibe it's going for. And then Tales of Argosa is, is in a different kind of category. It is so t tuned everything seems to tune in on that sword and sorcery vibe it really goes all in on its aesthetic appearance so i'll come back to that in a minute but um i, I want to say this is a good this is a good system too and you know that uh you know quibble aside the table of contents is hyperlinked which is not true for the other two so <laughs> that's a huge mark in this one's favor this pdf is 377 pages this is a very long book and you can see it goes through every sort of rule that you would need for a game it goes through all of it it goes through what a role-playing game is what this particular uh, role-playing game is and it talks about the three main themes of sword of cepheus which is a gritty gritty heroism dark sorcery and an open world uh, that's cool start off with uh, what this is all about um, now the game is a 2d6 system and you're trying to get over standard difficulty uh, DC is basically for the different kinds of tasks which is usually like 4, 8, 10, and 12 I think there's 11 I don't remember exactly you can go through the the list there um, so in that sense it's a very simple system it's 2d6 you add your modifier and you try to get higher uh, you know we've seen that in other games before maze rats comes to mind but instead of having the standard danger rule this is a check it's called a, it's called a throw and you do it for basically everything you try instead of just those very dangerous things you do it a lot more so um, you can have advantage, you can collaborate, you can try again. Sometimes <laughs> uh, failure has consequences. Um, unskilled characters get a minus three to their roll. And here are the common DCs. Yeah, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. Um, anything difficult that the referee would find amusing. I think that's great. So there's some art like this, which I think is really great in this book. I love these little character pieces, the little bits of art uh, for most of the pages. But there's a lot of blank pages, which is understandable, right? You can't have art for every page. Well, I would say normally you can't have art for every page, but as we're going to see for Tales of Argosa, they went above and beyond in terms of their art use. And they were very creative in what they used as art. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a bit. But let's focus on this one for now. I think this is a pretty good system for anybody who wants um, sort of a system, or I should say a classless sort of um you're going to have skills that you pick from lists. You're going to have backgrounds you're going to pick from lists. But you're really developing your character as you're going based on just the way that you want it to go. So you, you really don't have to pick that particular class and stick to that. There's a lot of variety in the way that you build your character. You roll on tables for your background and events in your background. You, you have um, choices you have to make as you get older in your character's history and eventually you get to the point where you become a character, a hero, uh, you muster out and you have benefits from that. You can either get money or you can have some extra traits. You can come, you can have a, you know, a familiar maybe or an ally. It's really, really cool in the way that you generate characters. There's not sort of a generic, okay, I picked this package and I'm done. You can, I mean, you can pick um, like set things. Oh, I'll just pick this kind of background and, uh, and go with the, the standard things for it um, and there are some careers as I said but the careers de determine the skills that you can pick and the events that occur to you not your abilities that's much more up to you to develop as you go through 
and uh, there are, let's so I'll go back there, barbarian, commoner, noble, pirate, priest, rogue, sailor, scholar, shaman, soldier, sorcerer, and vagabond. Then you have some life events, depending on where you're from, the hinterland, the village, the city, unusual events, and you muster out, and what are the benefits you get from that. You have some familiars, you could have, you could have a freehold, you could have a magic item, a mount, um, you could have thieves tools or a steed, stuff that you get from your background and from what's happened to you over the course of your character's life. You have lifeblood, stamina, traits, and you finalize your character at the end by purchase, equip, purchasing equipment. It's a whole bunch of equipments. Here there are packages, things you can just start with, right? And then you get some traits. And any character may choose any trait for which they meet the pre prerequisites. And the traits are awareness, you can become a battle mage, backstab, beast friendship, combat healer, berserker, right? So you build your character through your traits, through your skills, through your gear, rather than through a class. And so I think this is really, really going to appeal to a lot of people. Um, some good uh, injury tables, aging tables, <laughs> and a character generation example. And then you can have some non-human careers. So it's, it assumes everyone's going to play humans, but you can do a different game if you want. Antediluvians, draconids, dwarves, elves, gecko folk, gnomes, goblins, halflings, centaurs, insectoids, revenants, and trolls. Then you get character advancement and how that works. You have to spend XP to increase your skills. You can learn, learn some new language. You can gain some new traits. You spend XP on particular things to level up. That's a really interesting system, too. I think a lot of people are going to find that very cool. Rules about light, uh, light and darkness, engineering, rations, and hunting. And the rest of the book is essentially just laying out all of the rules for this game. Uh, and there are a lot of rules for this game. It goes into detail on optional rules, lots of things. So this is not a simple system in the sense of, hey, you've read eight pages, ten pages, you know the basic system, and you're done. Um, there are a lot of rules. But there also are a lot of rules, which means you have a lot of support if you want to run a game. You can you can check things, you can look up prices, you can look up all these different details that the game gives you. So there's a lot of resources that it gives you as well, not just rules, but resources. Uh, different kinds of weapons, different kinds of um, mounts. There's a whole section on sorcery and how sorcery works. Spells, they're dangerous, they're powerful. You can get mishaps, mutations. It's DCC-like in that regard. You can get corruption. So the game is definitely interested in playing a full sword and sorcery style world. You're getting, you know, dangerous magic and all that. But they do give you a lot access to a lot of magic. Uh, and you do have eldritch spells, particular spells that you learn. So there's lists that you can come up with, that you get, I should say. We're going to see that that's, slightly, that's different than the next two. There's a bestiary and how to create monsters uh, and all the different entries already in the list. A whole bunch, what you would expect, lots of good ones, demons, dinosaurs, genies, elephants, golems. Hydras. Stuff that you would need in a good sword and sorcery adventure. So, lots of that stuff. But as you can see, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of variety in the page look, and so it can get kind of hard to read through this whole book. Um, I, I found it difficult to keep, yeah, just to keep going because there wasn't, there were, you know, there are some incidental pieces of art, but there's just very little variety on the page. You're looking at very similar pages, and the font isn't my favorite choice, and so it's just kind of. It wasn't super fun or enjoyable to read, except for the content of it. Like you're looking, you're like, oh, that's a good idea. That's an interesting idea. I've seen that before. I've never seen that before. That's kind of what you're looking if you're if you're interested in kind of an experience. Which you know, a lot of books are interested in giving you a much more sort of experience while you're reading them. More more art, interesting font choices, little bits of fiction, things like that. This book is not interested in that. This book is like, here's what you need to play the game in 377 pages. So it's not brief, right? It's not brief. But it's also not, it doesn't go into a lot of extra stuff. That, that, those pages are used to tell you how to play the game. Which is, it's kind of a high ask, right? I mean, for a lot of people, um, now I should, I should I keep saying it's just a lot of rules. This is not as complicated as many games. Most of the rules are finished in the first few pages. What you get after that are variations, options, resources. So in that regard, I think this is a great book because even if you're not going to play it, there's lots of little bits of information about settlements and how to generate settlements, for example. Crises that a settlement can go through. Metropolises, creating NPCs. A lot of this stuff is specific to the system in terms of, like, say, monster lists. Uh, the monster stats. They're not going to find any new monsters or monster generation rules that will work for other games that would be you know, kind of worth it um, just getting a book for that or anything like that. But, again, 
if you want a system like this, 2D6, simple, classless, um, with everything that you need to play an RPG, this system has it for you. And there are some adventure seats at the back, and they're really cool. I like them a lot. The Millstone, Defending the Village, the Cavern, uh, the Pilgrimage, and a breakdown of... The Pilgrimage is my favorite because it's a breakdown of what happens each day of the Pilgrimage. And the Lonely Outpost. And then Super Science, if you want to add in some, you know, science fiction into your games. Blasters, stun bombs, radium rifles, power armor, all that. Inspirational Media at the very back. And the open game license at the very back you have the index as well with a spell index at the very end so the sword of cepheus is a very interesting system it is something that we have i mean we've seen particular bits of these rules before we've seen particular bits of um this game before in other forms but this particular combination of course is new and the fact that it's all in one the fact that it really doesn't waste time giving you useless stuff it gets right to the point. I think it's really cool. Uh, sort of Cepheus, second edition. I recommend you guys check it out. I don't think it's gonna be for everybody. And I think of the three that I'm gonna be reviewing today, it's probably my least favorite, but that's probably because uh, the other two are much more like distinctive. They stand out as, as, as unique, really unique. Um, this one is a good solid, it seems to me, a good solid system on which to build a sword and sorcery game. And there's a lot of good resources here too. So if you're interested in playing Sword and Sorcery, you don't have a good system, you don't have a comprehensive system yet, and you don't want either, as we'll see in the next two, something very, very open and free form and barely, uh, barely a, um, a system at all, or something that is really, really structured and builds everything in, uh, then this is probably a good choice. So the second is Million Colored Sun. This one is much shorter, it's only 98 pages. This is a Pulp Sword and Sorcery RPG. The art is just amazing. I love this sort of gonzo style of art. It reminds me of, um, well, it reminds me of a lot of different things. Fi, I say, for example. Um, I think it's the same artist. Million Colored Sun. Rules Light Sword and Sorcery RPG. And really, it is, it is Rules Light. Um, introduction uh, by the author and Clark Ashton Smith. A quote, a quote from Clark Ashton Smith. What is a role-playing game? I think that's sort of a by law. You have to include a what is a role-playing game in any role-playing game these days. Even for these very, very, I would say, genre-specific niche RPGs, which are probably going to only be played by people who have played RPGs for years. <laughs> I don't know why very, very kind of, you know, small, like, niche RPGs feel the need to do this. But, you know, hey, you might run into it if you're someone who has no idea what an RPG is. We um, have character creation, and character creation is super freeform. I like that you have a few stats, body, brain, and nerve, um, and then you have a calling, and there are a bunch of sample callings, but you can come up with your own, and all of the benefits of that calling are up to you and the GM. There's the same thing with gift. You have a unique talent, and there are some samples, but the samples are very broad. I mean, panther-like agility. Ain't got time to bleed. I love that quote from uh, Predator, of course. Unearthly mentor. Blessed, Elf, <laughs> Hard to Kill, Ladies' Man, right? These are all just random gifts that you've got. And so that means, then you have a weakness, and again, sample weaknesses, superstitious, stranger in a strange land, escaped slave, a fool and his money are soon parted. Wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> and then you've got some skills, and again, there are some sample skills. Alertness, belly dancing, musician, drinking, religion, tracking, pickpocket, Myths and legends, juggling, literacy. <laughs> That's great. And then some weapon skills. Now, if you have a weakness, such as a vow of pacifism, and you can't use a weapon, then you can have other rules for what kind of weapons you can use. Those are weapon skills as well. And you can have some non-human PCs if you want. Then you have what the stats do and how they work and how to assign numbers to them. You roll a d20, divide by 2, add 6, repeat 4 times. You have 5 numbers. This is a roll under system, so you're rolling a d20 and trying to roll under whatever you've assigned to each of your attributes. Um, and then you have your skills. You have a gift number and a weakness number. You have skills and that gives you a bonus to if you're rolling in that area. And you get some weapon skills as well. And you get health points, which is determined by your body. And you have fortune points, which is d20 divided by five. That's how many fortune points you start with. Um, good luck, you can use fortune in different ways. And then who would play them in the movie? WWPTITN. 
uh, and and that's just your general, not just physical appearance, but attitude, emotions, personality, the whole thing. Who would play them in a movie? It's interesting. Okay, um, there's some sample people, which I think is really funny. <laughs> there's some sample actors if you can't think of any people to play your characters. Viggo Mortensen. That's funny. Okay, sample taglines, because you got to have a tagline, right? got to have what your character is up about. I, that's what I do. I drink and I know things. It's Tyrion Lannister, right? No, I rob for the rich and pretty much keep it for myself. Remember, there's always something cleverer than yourself. There's some really good ones here. Obscure lore. Uh, it's a casual category for character information related to story. Stuff that matters. Stuff that the GM can use to bring into the game. Or just details about your character's background that would be fun. So, <laughs> chainmail bikini. Sample gear. <laughs> well, that, uh, this is really leaning into that, right? Over the top, gonzo, sword and sorcery nonsense, which I love. The rules. Weakness rolls, when to use them, second chance rolls, skills, resisted. A very simple system. You're talking about degrees of success or failure with a d20 based on those stats that I've just laid out. And that's it. Combat, very simple, straightforward. Damage and how damage works. Um, you inflict the difference between your role uh, and the guard's defense role, or the enemy's attack role, or the enemy's uh, combat role. It's the difference between them. It's really, really deadly in that regard. Because you can roll a 20, and they can roll a 1, and you just wreck them. Um, I guess you have to still have to roll under your combat skill in order to hit them, so makes sense. Uh, you have armor, you have rabble, nameless combatants usually used to uh, you know, harry the opponent. Combat modifiers, how fortune points work to modify damage, death and incapacitation. Very simple system. Now again, there isn't a ton of art, There's, there are incidental art, but the, what you're looking at on each page is very small. You're not staying much on each page. So the information is very, very uh, self-contained very easily. You're not flipping through a lot. You're not reading a lot. If you want to know about magic, you know it in a couple pages and how it works. Um, basic, I really like how magic works. Basically, if you have a calling, you can't use magic if it's just a calling. But if it's a, if you have zero words, you can only use zero words to describe the kind of magic or the magic that you're casting. Um, and if you have just a gift, you have one word. If you have a calling and a gift, it's three. If you have plus 13 in each, you get an extra one. So if you had a plus 13 in calling and in gift, you would have five words that you could use to describe the kind of magic. So instead of just potion making and healing, right? Um, whenever a character cast, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you get much more magic. You get a bunch more magic words. Right? So sample magic words, and here's a bunch of them. Um, not magic, shape shifting, telekinetic, channeling, battle, cartomancy, chaos. And then how to, how to cast spells. And generally, what they do, right? Spells generally attack someone, heal someone, defend someone, buff someone, or penalize someone. Or they alter reality. Cantrips and how that might work. Magical dangers. Um, and then sample of play. Great piece of art there. And then Game Master's Guide. Very simple. And what I like about this is it has a section on running sword and sorcery. Yeah, chapter 8, running sword and sorcery. And, and great advice about what makes a sword and sorcery game different. I think it's very it's very easy for people to be like, I'm going to run sword and sorcery. And they change a few things and then they just run a, a standard D&D game or something like that. It's like, no, there's, there's a different tone that needs to be there for a sword and sorcery game. Um, and a different way of running it different kinds of challenges, the different um, themes that you're going to use, the different kinds of NPCs you're going to use. Certainly in the way you describe things, the world building, but but also just in the way that the, the stakes are played out. Lots of great monsters, and then a, a sample of Venster at the very end. Interesting uh, options there. You can have different kinds of victims and different people who want them back and different rewards. If you don't want to just play the same one every time, or you want to tailor it to your group. Very simple map. And what's going on? It's pretty linear. You're just moving through the islands, going to fight the Cyclops, rescuing the victim. Uh, useful tables. How does the party meet? Who is the big villain? Fantastical destinations for adventure. Fabulous treasures. Wilderness encounters. City encounters. What happened to all your money? And then some sample player characters and additional inspirational materials. Books, nonfiction, movies, games, artists, and music. And character sheet at the back. Million Colored Sun is awesome. I think it's great. It's very, very simple. 
uh, light system. But if you're going to play a very, very light sword and sorcery game, you don't want to invest too much in terms of time getting your characters together. You like a, a sort of sillier tone. You like a more free-form game, or you're interested in trying one, where characters come up, players come up with their own characters like down down the line. Then this is going to be something that's really enjoyable, I think. And I like the art. It's really silly. It's great. The last is Tales of Argosa. This is a sword and source adventure. I think this is the second edition of, um, what is it, uh, low fantasy or low something fantasy. I think it's what it's called. Um, it's the second edition of, uh, um, it says it on here, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> low fantasy gaming, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's the second edition of low fantasy gaming. Um, this is a really cool game. First of all, as you can see, the pages are covered with amazing art. And that's true just throughout this book, that every page is a delight to look at because there's something interesting to look at. Look at it. Every single page has interest. They went above and beyond in crafting this book to make it just a delight to look at. It's not always the clearest to read and the table of contents are not hyperlinked. <laughs> When I say it's not the clearest to read, I mean, you know, there's a lot of dense the text. The font has been chosen to be interesting rather than super clear, and so there's times when I just my eye doesn't scan it super easily, but oh, it's not that. It's not a huge problem. Um, there's a lot of information on every page, and it's designed around the art, which is great. It's really interesting. It's not as clear, but I would take, honestly, I would take interest over clarity most of the time in books like this because the whole book is designed to be this way. It's not an accident. I love it. I think it's really, really good. Here's the core features of this game. Nine classes, ninth level level, ninth level max cap, flatter hit point curve. Uh, you get unique features, which is another really interesting element of this game. I'll talk about that more in a minute. It's a roll under system. We've seen a lot of that recently. I think roll under systems are really popular. I tend to like the D20 roll over systems um, where you just add a modifier, try to hit a DC. But I know that there's a certain natural quality to understanding a roll under system, it's very easy for new people to pick up because your stat is what you're trying to roll under instead of your stat generating a number to, which then you add to. So it's just it's it's one step more, um, it's one step easier, and that's often what you need. So I understand its its popularity. I just don't prefer it. Um, anyway, the basic rules for the game here, are the basic features of the game, it's a D20 system, uh, how to play right away. And I would say it's very good about laying out what you need to know as you go. You have backgrounds, which give you stat attributes and some skills, perhaps some equipment. Um, you have your base attributes, strength, dex, con, intelligence, perception, willpower, charisma, and initiative. So looking at slightly more, uh, yeah, a few more than the standard six. But we've often seen... Uh, you know, wisdom divided, for example, and really here you just have an extra initiative score. And you also have luck. Luck comes, mostly it goes, <laughs> you can regenerate it, but it mostly goes away. You have the different races here, humans, dwarves, elves, halflings, and half scorn, which sound a little bit like orcs. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like orcs. Prone to instincts for war, poor memory and analytical ability, hard to kill, strong, pinkish skin, heavy set, wide jaws, small misshapen ears. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like beast men, sound a little bit like pig orcs, you know, the old piggy orcs. Uh, not quite, obviously they don't have, they're not pigs, but, but, but they sound a little bit like that. And then you have classes, and uh, each class gets hit points, um, and uh, unique features, and the unique features are a really interesting element of each class, where you kind of come up with something. And it says you can feel free to borrow from other systems if you want and just adapt it to this game. Yeah, basically, they're feats. Artificers, barbarians, bards, cultists, fighters, magic users, monks, rangers, rogues, and then you get yeah, the rest of it. But um, moving on, the classes are really cool, standard. Um, but they're, you know, you pick the class and that's what you stick with. There are, you can, uh, you can cross class, you can... Um, get some cross-class features and get abilities from other, you know, archetypes and other classes, but that's kind of, uh, it's, it's features. It's a limited, mostly you're sticking to your class and that's the stuff you get from it. 
I, mean, I really like this. There's party bonds table. It's a really important element of games. I think that are off. It's often um, ignored or it's hand waved or it's assumed that DMs will do it in session zero. Not every DM does. So I think this is a great one to do party bonds uh, to to make as part of the. It says optional step, but I think I would make it required part of the the character creation. Or I would make some form of party bonding in session zero required. Unique features. And these are some of the feats you can get with, again, options for more because you can just take kind of whatever you want from other games if you want, like 5th edition, for example, or 3rd edition, or Pathfinder. Skills and how skills work. Skills give you a relevant bonus and let you re-roll. And that's that's what's interesting. There, there are uh, degrees of success, or rather there is a, a certain degree of success called a great success or a terrible failure. And if you're skilled, then you can turn a terrible failure into an ordinary failure or a regular success into a great success if you have the skill. So skills allow you for better success and they give you a little bonus and they let you re-roll so you're more consistent with your skills. Um, and sometimes it's required. If you have a, a relevant skill, it can help you or a required skill. So skills are not like, um, you know, you're gonna get a bunch of bonuses in that skill, you're not, you know, persuasion plus eight. It's you either have persuasion or you don't. And if you have it, then you can get some benefits from it. That's kind of cool. But you can't, it doesn't seem to me, you can't become better at persuasion except by making your charisma go up. Uh, equipment and how that works. Now again, I, I, I think this is a great system. It's a lot of information. It would take a while to get all of this stuff down. But a lot of it isn't, like, if you're, if you're familiar with systems, especially roll under systems, then there are touchstones that we've seen before. There are you know, connections that we've seen before. So you're going to go, oh, that's right. Okay, it's using this sort of system. Oh, it's using that sort of system. So once you see that, it's not going to be like learning a bunch of brand new stuff. For a new player, of course, it's all new. But if you have had experience with other games, other systems, if you have a wide selection of, of RPGs you've either played or tried, especially roll under systems, then a lot of this stuff is going to be familiar. I was reading through it and I was like, oh, that, that reminds me of Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells, for example. Um, a lot of the stuff in here did remind me of that. Um, how initiative works. I like the way initiative works in this. Uh, and then you get, again, that art is really good. There's a system for escaping from dungeons, which is, or battles, which is great. Uh, if you tell players, hey, there is a set set of rules for how to get out of a battle and out of retreat, they're going to maybe be more likely to think of it. Because if you just say, hey, we need to get out and you just try to run, then you run into that risk of like, okay, we're getting into non-chase rules, or, or how, if we don't have chase rules, then I'm, I'm running 30 feet, you're running 30 feet. I'm running 30 feet, you're running 30 feet. It's really boring. So chase rules add an interest to that whole side of the game, which often happens or needs to happen, but otherwise is very boring. And it's, it's funny, it's boring and the stakes are very high. So players get very frustrated with it, at least in my experience. Uh, how combat works, exploits, which are special things you can do, injury and death, and how that works. There's trauma that you can take from wounds, how, how you heal, heal and recover, and how sorcery works. Magic is pretty awesome. There's a spell list with some particular spells. And downtime, lots of rules for downtime. Lots of rules for downtime. And then this is what I think of, I like about this book so much, is the GM tools. Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of tables for everything you might need madness tables monsters and monster lists how to make monsters um different kinds of monsters and different uh you know, ways that they can be made more interesting and things like that um once you get past the monsters you get naval combat oracle rules rival adventuring parties how to play the game solo if you want uh traps and how that works treasure tables lots of treasure tables lair treasure minor magical items major magical items you know Minor charms, major uh, charms, you know, relics, basically, talisman, oh, tons and tons and tons of cool stuff. And then optional rules at the very end, how to convert from other systems and an index. This is also not hyperlinked, but that's okay. So Tales of Argosa is really fantastic. I think it's one of the better sword and sorcery systems out there. I like how it's all tailored into that one system. It's not, it's, it's complex in one sense. It's not, it's not as simple as Million Colored Sun, but it is not really all that complex. Once you look at that core rules at the very beginning, the core attributes of the game, and you get a sense of how it works, the rest of it falls into place very quickly. 
So I, I'd, I'd recommend that anybody who's interested in sort of a cohesive sword and sorcery system, I recommend you guys check it out. So this was Tales of Argosa, Million Colored Sun, and Sword of Cepheus 2nd Edition, or Cepheus 2nd Edition. All right, guys, that'll do it. Hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another one.